Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Proverbs 35, every word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is a rock and all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So if you have the truth, you have an absolute to build your life on as opposed to the shifting sands of the culture, the shifting sands of human opinion, the shifting hands of human wisdom, which create nothing but confusion, contention, shifting sand, and a tangled morass with no absolutes. So you want the truth. You want the Word of God. That's why the series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. So today's sermon topic is foolish feelings. Foolish feelings. Feelings. Now, feelings are not a mistake, okay? Feelings are not a result of the fall or a result of sin, okay? God gave us feelings. So feelings are absolutely part of His divine intention in His creation. However, our feelings are part of our fallen nature. Just like everything else in our life is fallen, and it needs to be lifted up by truth. It needs to be undergirded by truth, so we will behave appropriately. I mean, Scripture says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death, Proverbs 14, 12. Because of the fall, we don't know the right way to live, okay? And because our emotions are fallen, okay, they, um, they can easily get askew, okay, and they can easily lead us astray and take us down the wrong path. Because although they are part of God's de design and part of His original intention, okay, they are fallen. So we need to make sure that our emotions are on track with truth, okay? Love, hate, fear, anxiety, joy, okay, all of the emotions that we experience we can easily get off track with them and they can lead us astray and they can lead us down a destructive path because they are part of our fallen nature. The way to keep them on track is to keep them aligned with God's truth, to keep them aligned with God's word. Okay, so I'm going to talk about foolish feelings in the context of the relationship between King David and his rebellious son Absalom. Okay, this takes place, this story takes place in 2 Samuel chapters 13 to 19. So I'm going to give a broad <clears throat> bird's eye perspective of this relationship to illustrate how foolish feelings can lead us astray. Okay, how foolish feelings can lead us astray. Now, to look at the big picture, Absalom essentially was a rebel against his father. He tried to usurp his kingdom. He was an insurrectionist. He was guilty of treason. He was a first degree murderer, okay? And David totally acts inappropriately in response to the sins and the rebellion of his son. He becomes consumed by fallen emotions and he completely forgets about justice. God's justice, God's truth, God's law, and he becomes consumed by his sentimental emotions that are completely devoid of truth, okay? He gets lost in the foolishness of his feelings, okay? So here I'm going to be, uh, pick up the story in 2 Samuel 19, which kind of encompasses the whole issue of Absalom's rebellion and David's reaction. Then I'm going to get more granular and get into the details that led up to what happens in chapter 19. Okay, so this is 2 Samuel 19. This is going to be our overview and bedrock passage for the relationship between David and Absalom. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, The king is grieved for his son, 
and the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have disgraced all of your servants, who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. Second Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 to 6. Okay, here we see David mourning and weeping and grieving for his son Absalom. Now, Joab was the general of King David's army, okay? And what happened is there was a civil war between Absalom and his rebels and David and his soldiers, and ultimately David prevails by the grace of God, okay? David prevails by the grace of God. And here David is weeping for his son, Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, oh, my son, oh, my son. And he's grieved. And because of that, all his soldiers who basically saved Israel from the destruction of this insurrectionist murdering rebel, they come back from the battle. They're grieved and they're mourning, okay? They should be shouting for joy. You know, God achieved this great victory through them, which essentially saved Israel from imploding at the hands of this rebellious, murdering, treacherous son. And they're grieving because David's grieving. And Joab calls him out. He says, look, okay, you've done a great disservice and great disgrace to all these servants and soldiers who have risked their lives for you and have saved your life and saved your kingdom and saved your kingship, okay? And you basically don't even care. You know, you're treating your friends like enemies and your enemies, you're loving your enemies, this murdering insurrectionist. So we can see right here that David's emotions are totally foolish and have total and blatant disregard for justice and truth and what's right according to God's will and his law. Okay, so let's get into the events that preceded this, okay? Well, in 2 Samuel 12, verses, uh, chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, <clears throat> we see the treachery and the evil of Absalom unfolding. So what happens is Amnon, who is a half-brother of Absalom and one of David's sons, um, essentially rapes one of his daughters. Her name is Tamar, okay? So he is incestuous, he is evil, he is wicked, he is foolish. I'm talking about Amnon here, not Absalom. So he essentially rapes his half-sister, okay? He rapes her and totally disgraces her to the point where she spends the rest of her life not bearing any children and never getting married. He completely disgraces her in incestuous rape. This is Amnon, okay? So... That's what happens. Amnon essentially rapes his sister. Disgusting, filthy, treacherous. Now, this is a crime according to Deuteronomy uh, 22.24. This is a crime that is worthy of the death penalty. Okay, Rape is basically something that's supposed to be punished with the death penalty. Okay, Now let's see how David reacts when he finds out about Amnon's rape, okay, incestuous rape of his daughter, Tamar. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. 2 Samuel 13, verses 21 to 22. Okay, David's very angry, but does he do anything? No. Does he bring his son to justice? No. Does he have his son arrested and tried for the crime of rape? No. And what does it say that Absalom did? It just says he didn't talk to his brother. 
He hated him, okay? He hated his brother for raping his sister, okay? But he didn't do anything. He should have brought him to justice, okay? He should have had him arrested, and ultimately, according to the law, Amnon should have been killed, okay? Rape, according to Deuteronomy, is a crime that deserves the death penalty, okay? This is totally against God's will, all right? And Absalom basically, he just harbors a grudge and hatred for his half-brother Amnon, but he doesn't do anything about it. David's angry, but he doesn't do anything about it. I mean, what does Proverbs 13, 24 say? He who spares the rod hates his child. He who loves his child is careful to discipline him. I mean, discipline is basically created by God to be remedial, to get his people away from sin and back on the righteous path, okay? It's supposed to teach them to do what's right and not to do what's wrong, okay? But here we see David, he's angry, but he doesn't do anything, okay? Absalom basically harbors and nurses a hatred for his half-brother, but he doesn't bring him to justice. He doesn't do anything, okay? So we see that there's no paternal punishment, and in terms of brotherly concern, there, there isn't anything. There's just, just a hatred, okay? So we can see this kind of behavior from David basically ignoring the egregious sin of one of his sons, that he's completely negligent, and, and Absalom is too, okay? So we can see that there's no uh, godly paternity going on in this family at all. Okay, now, two years go by, two years go by, and Absalom is nursing this grudge and this hatred of his half-brother Amnon, for raping his sister, okay? He's hanging on to it. It's becoming a poison in his veins. And we know what Scripture says about holding a grudge, right? Do not let the sun go down on your anger, okay? We're supposed to be angry but not sin. In other words, our anger should have some sort of con uh, constructive course. You know, when we're angry, it's just it's justifiable, righteous anger. It should lead to punishment and justice. It shouldn't lead to nursing of a grudge, which just creates more destruction. Nevertheless, Absalom nurses this grudge against his brother for two years. And listen what happens after that. This is from 2 Samuel 13, later in the chapter. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Watch now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each one got on his mule and fled. 2 Samuel 13, verses 28 to 29. All right. What happens here is Absalom hatches a plot to essentially murder his half-brother Amnon, okay? This is premeditated murder, okay? He basically hatches a scheme to get Amnon with his servants, and what happens? He says, kill him. Get him drunk and kill him. Get him drunk and kill him. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous. See how he twists, you know, a positive attribute into something evil? Courageous, be courageous in, in helping me commit first degree murder. Be courageous in aiding and abetting, and abetting me to, to murder my half-brother. How twisted is his mind, okay? Nevertheless, the servants carry out his command, all right, and they murder Amnon. Okay, they get him drunk and they murder him. All right, this is first degree murder. This is premeditated murder from Absalom. Okay, now what does Absalom do? But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years, and King David longed to go 
to Absalom. 2 Samuel 13, verses 37 to 39. Okay, so Absalom flees Jerusalem. He flees, okay? Now, what does David do? What does David do? He mourns for him. He mourns for his murderous, first degree murderous son. For three years. For three years. And he longs to go see him. All right? So David's emotions are completely amok here. This is foolish feelings in the extreme. All right? His son's guilty of first degree murder. And he mourns for him? You know, he should be appalled at what he did. Okay? First degree murder. First degree murder. And he's mourning for him every day for three years? What's going on? His emotions are running amok. His emotions are not grounded in truth. His emotions have no regard for God's law. Okay? For God's justice. He's forgetting about God here. He's putting his son and his sentimental affections for his son above God's law. Meaning he's putting his affection for his son above God here. This is horrible. Alright, so what happens after that? Well, ultimately, Absalom is gone for three years and ultimately he comes back. Okay, And for two years... He comes back to Jerusalem, but he's in his own house and he can't see his father. He wants to see his father David to reconcile with his father. And he wants to use Joab, who is the general of David's army, as an intercessor or a mediator. Okay, But Joab ref refuses to bring Absalom to his father. So how does Absalom respond? He lights Joab's fields on fire. He lights his fields on fire, the general of his father's army. Okay? Here's more rebellion. Here's more subterfuge. Here is more sabotage at the hands of this murderous, rebellious son. Okay? He lights Joab's fields on fire. Okay? Now, what does David do about it? Nothing. Listen to this. Ultimately, that treacherous act does get Absalom before his father, okay? And his father forgives him. Now listen to what happens here. After this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me then I would give him justice. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. 2 Samuel 15, verses 1 to 6. Now, here we have treason really starting to take shape, okay? Now Absalom comes back before the king, and he gets all these men and horses, and he sets himself up as the judge in the gate, okay? That was the responsibility of the king, okay? He was the one who was supposed to adjudicate in these legal decisions in the gate. But Absalom says, oh no, I'm going to do it. Didn't tell his father. I'm going to set myself up as judge with all these people who have all these problems and have all these civil issues and they come to the king for justice. I'm going to act as the mediator. I'm going to act as the judge. Okay? I'm going to usurp my father's responsibility behind his back. Behind his back. Okay? This is treason in the first degree. And what happens? He starts to win over the hearts of the people. He starts to win over the hearts of the people as it says 
at the end of 2 Samuel 15, 6. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He's a traitor, all right? Now, it gets worse. His treachery grows even more extreme. Listen to this. This is from 2 Samuel 15. Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithoth Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, from his city, from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. Now a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Okay, so what happens is Absalom tells his father David, I have to go to, to Hebron to fulfill a vow that I made to the Lord. Okay, so he's full of lies and deceit. So he goes there and he has these men blow trumpets saying Absalom reigns in Hebron. Okay, so what happens is he ultimately turns more and more and more people to his allegiance against his father. Okay. The hearts of the people are for Absalom. So he has them blow these trumpets. Absalom rules in Hebron, okay? So he's creating this rebellious force against his father, okay? This is total blatant first degree treason and sabotage, you know? Okay, he sent spies throughout the land, okay? This is underhanded, okay? This is crafty, this is sneaky, this is evil, this is treachery in the first degree. So he turns essentially the nation against his father, all right? This is the worst form of treason, which by the way, also deserves the death penalty. Okay, so ultimately what happens is a civil war ensues between David and the ones loyal to him and Absalom and the ones loyal to him to you know, determine the kingship of Israel. Okay, David's king, and Absalom is trying to usurp his throne through treachery, through treachery. Okay, ultimately, there's a big war that ensues, and it ensues in the woods of Ephraim, this densely wooded area, okay? And there's an enormous battle, there's an enormous battle between the rebels of Absalom and the faithful of David, okay, in the woods of Ephraim. Now, when Joab's getting ready to go out to face Absalom and his rebels, listen to what David says to Joab. Now the king had commanded Joab, Abishai, and Atai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And the people heard when the king gave all the captain's orders concerning Absalom. 2 Samuel 18, verse 5. Deal gently for my sake with Absalom, the murderer, the first degree murderer, the one who is guilty of treason, the one who is guilty of sabotage, the one who is a liar, the one who tried to usurp my authority in the gate, Okay, the one who proclaimed himself king in Hebron, Hebron, deal gently with him for my sake. What? What in the world is going on in his head? Foolish feelings, that's what. Foolish feelings. Deal gently with the man Absalom for my sake? He's completely lost sight of the law. He's completely lost sight of truth. He's completely lost sight of justice. Let me get bigger. He's completely lost sight of God. His affections for his son are more important than his relationship with God. Because he's completely forgotten about justice. 
His sentimental emotions and feelings have completely run amok and have co come completely unglued from truth, from justice, from the law, from what God instituted, okay, in the law. All right, so, deal gently with my son. His emotions are completely amok here. Now, what happens ultimately is this huge war ensues in the wooded, dense areas and rugged terrain of Ephraim, and 20,000 troops die, okay? 20,000 die at the hands of David's troops, okay? And Absalom is one of those who is killed. And it says in the scripture that the dense woods actually took more that day. The dense woods and the rugged terrain took more lives than the sword because it was so densely wooded and there were so many tree limbs everywhere, you know, basically running people down on horses. But anyway, what happens is Absalom gets caught in tree branches by his hair, okay? And Joab and his troops murder him, okay? They kill, well, sorry, it's not murder, it's it's in war, but he directly disobeys the orders of David to deal with his son gently. So that's kind of a sidebar. It's another sermon for another day because Joab has, its own, has his own agenda. Okay, But nevertheless, what happens is Joab kills Absalom. He runs his spear through him three times, and then all of the people that are with Joab kill him while he's still alive, throw him into a pit, and throw a bunch of stones on top of him, which is akin to essentially stoning him to death. Now, what happens is David's troops win the great resounding victory, and 20,000 die, and it preserves David's kingship. It preserves Israel. By the grace of God, Israel is preserved, okay? But listen to how David reacts. Does he react with rejoicing? Does he re react saying, the Lord has delivered me from this rebellious, murderous, treacherous son and has preserved justice in the kingdom of Israel and has preserved his people, praise God? Is that how he, he reacts to this great victory? Let's see. Let's see what happens when he finds out that Absalom is dead, okay? Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And he, as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. 2 Samuel 18, verse 33. Wow. Wow. His emotions are completely out of control. Foolish feelings running amok, okay? His affections for his son are completely out of control. He's not, he's not thanking God for this tremendous victory, for the preservation of his witness nation. He is mourning his murderous, treacherous son. Oh, my son Absalom, oh, my son, my son, oh, Absalom, oh, I wish I had died in your place, okay? Now, let's go back to the original bedrock verses that set up this sermon. I'm going to add a little more detail at the end as well. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, The king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived 
and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. 2 Samuel 19, verses 1 to 6. Okay, obviously Joab has hit the, net, hit the nail on the head here. Okay, you love your enemies and you hate your friends. Okay, and if we had all died trying to defend your kingdom, it would have pleased you just fine as long as your treacherous, murderous, rebellious, insurrectionist son had lived. Okay, this is righteous indignation on the part of Joab. Okay, he's completely correct. This is totally right. Okay. He needed, David needed to be scolded, okay, in the first degree. Here he is weeping over this murderous, treacherous, insurrectionist son, and he is basically mourning so that all of this, all of the troops who put their lives at stake to defend his kingdom, they're mourning. They should be rejoicing. They should be rejoicing for saving the nation of Israel from this murderous traitor, okay? He would have destroyed Israel. Absalom would have destroyed Israel if he became king. David should be glad, okay? You know, and if there's sadness in his heart, the sadness should be in over the sin of his son, over the treachery of his son, and how he ruined his life and almost destroyed Israel, okay? The sadness and the grief shouldn't be over some maudlin affection that has nothing to do with justice, law, or the truth. Okay, he is completely foolish in his feelings here. His heart is running amok. Okay, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17 9. Okay, now David's heart completely deceived him in his relationship with his son Absalom. Okay, because his emotions that were not grounded in God's law were not grounded in God's truth, but just were sentimental emotions based on his kingship and his blood relationship with his son completely, completely made his mind run amok, okay? He could not see any truth. He could not see any justice. He could not see the blatant and flagrant violation of his son. Okay, how his son broke the law over and over and over again and committed crimes that were worthy of the death penalty, and he just reacted with this maudless, maudlin, mawkish emotion. Oh, oh, Absalom, oh, my son. Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, you're a first degree murderer. I don't care. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, you tried to usurp my authority. Oh, I don't care. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, you tried to. Take my kingship from me and destroy the nation that God ordained for me. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, I don't care. You know? Wow. His emotions completely ran amok, okay? And that's why affection for family, you know, you can't let that get in the way of truth and justice and law and your love for God. Your love for God has to be supreme, okay? And David is a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14 said God was going to choose David over Saul as king because David was a man after God's own heart. And he certainly was. But even the man after God's own heart can let his emotions run amok and they can lead him astray. Okay, now just for a strong contrast, let's look at the behavior of somebody whose emotions function properly, whose emo emotions function properly, okay? This is, obviously, Jesus Christ, the man who knew no sin, okay? Now, let's look at how he responds to his family properly in a situation where he's surrounded by the masses in Luke chapter 8. Then his mother and brothers came to him, and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Luke chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. Okay? 
Now, the affections of Jesus and his emotions function properly here, okay? He said, my mother and my brothers are the people who obey my law. They're not people who are bl blood relatives. You know, the relationship of family is people who are underneath the hand of God, people who obey God's law, okay? People who do the will of God and obey his law. That determines my affections. That determines my relationships, okay? Now, Jesus had four half-brothers and a couple of sisters as well, all right? Now, does that mean he hated them? No, no, he did not hate them. But his allegiance was with those who obey the law of God, okay? It's based on a love for God, ultimately, not on blood relationships. And he doesn't let his filial emotions get in the way of what truth is, of what justice is, of what righteousness is. And that's underneath the hand of God. So his true affections are for the people of God and people who obey the law of God, okay? This is completely the opposite of the way David behaves, okay? He's choosing family blood over justice, over truth, over righteousness, over God, okay? So Jesus, his emotions are completely uh, in tune with the will of God and with the law of God. Now, let's look at when Jesus is grieving, okay? When Jesus is really grieving in his heart, he's grieving with righteous grief, okay? He's grieving with righteous grief, not with mawkish, sentimental emotions that are completely falling. He grieves with righteous grief, okay? Listen to this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Matthew 23, 37. Now, Jesus is mourning against all these people he's preaching the gospel and the good news to, okay? They reject him. They reject salvation, okay? They killed the prophets. They stoned those who were sent to her, who called on her to repent, okay? To turn away from evil. To turn away from evil, to turn towards good. To turn away from injustice and to turn back to good. To turn away from their own fallen hearts and to turn toward the truth of God. And Jesus gives them the gospel and they reject him. And his heart's broken over this, okay? This is the right kind of grief. This is the right kind of sorrow. This is when the emotions are functioning properly. His heart is broken because these people are damned. These people reject the good news of the grace of God. These people reject the gospel of salvation. These people choose evil over good. They choose damnation over salvation with hard hearts. And it breaks the heart of Christ because he knows they're going to spend eternity in torment, okay? This is the right kind of grief. This is the right kind of grief, all right? Now, so we learn through the example of Christ, when our emotions are aligned with God's truth, when our emotions are aligned with the understanding of God's will and his law, they will function properly, okay? But when they are not aligned with God's truth, when they are not aligned with God's law, when they are not aligned with God's justice and what God ordains, they run amok. They run amok, okay? And we see this in the relationship between David and Absalom. Oh, my son, oh, my son, oh, my son, Absalom, oh, my son, the first degree murderer, oh, my son, the insurrectionist. Oh, my son who tries to usurp my authority. Oh, my son who steals my counselor, Ahithophel. Oh, my son who tries to usurp my kingdom and blow it up. Oh, my son, my son. Completely askew. Foolish feelings in the extreme. And it can happen to the best of God's people. David is a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14. But his blood relationship and his affections for his son 
are so warped and so askew because they're not grounded in justice and truth that they lead him astray and into foolishness. So we have to watch our emotions. We need to make sure they're aligned with the Word of God. Then we will respond properly, okay? You who love the Lord hate evil, okay? Psalm 97.10. That pretty much, much encapsulates it, okay? If we love God, then our hate, okay, will be proper hate, okay? Our mourning will be proper mourning over the lost souls, okay? Our sadness and our grief will be proper sadness and proper grief. It won't be self-pity, okay? It won't be self-pity, and we're, we're not just going to be sorrowful in, our own, sorrowful, sorrowful in our own hearts because of our own fallen emotions and our fallen affections. We need to have our emotions grounded in the truth of the Word of God because the heart is a deceiver, okay? Our emotions are given to us by God, but they're part of our fallen nature, and if they're going to uh, function properly, they need to be grounded in God's truth, in His justice, in His Word, and in His law, right? If you abide in me and abide in my word, truly you are my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, John 17, 17. And what is one of the freedoms we experience when we know that truth? Freedom from the deceitful heart. Freedom from our fallen emotions. So our emotions function properly, okay? Now, if our emotions are going to function properly, we need to be undergirded by God's truth, and if we're going to live by it, we have to be saved, okay? Now, every human on the planet is a sinner. All have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. There's not one righteous, not one. There's not one who understands or seeks after God. That's Romans 3.10. The previous verse was Romans 3.23. So if you've ever lied, cheated, stolen anything, left, lusted after somebody else's car, house, or wife, and we've all done it, then you're guilty, I'm guilty, we're all guilty of sin. And this separates us from a just and holy God, okay? But there's only one solution that can reconcile us to this just and holy God. And this is the man who knew no sin, okay? For our sake he made the man who knew no sin, to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That man who knew no sin is Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53.5 He was pierced for our uh, transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The penalty for our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So the just and holy God punishes his just and holy sinless Son for the sins of all of believing humanity before and after the cross. So anybody who confesses Jesus as Lord, what happens is the holy creator of the universe doesn't see their sin anymore when they confess Jesus as Lord. He sees his holy son who paid the sin debt in full. Okay? It's amazing. That's how God reconciles the sinner to his holiness through the sin payment of his sinless son. So once we confess him as Lord, God sees us, the sinner, as sinless. Truly, truly a miraculous gift of God. Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So once we confess Jesus as Lord, we are reconciled to the just and holy God once and forever. Not only are we saved, but at that moment, we receive His indwelling Holy Spirit. God comes to live and breathe inside of us, okay? I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to do what is right, okay? So ultimately, we have God living and breathing inside of us to move us to keep his decrees and his laws, okay? And he's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, Isaiah 11:2. So God comes to live and breathe inside of us to guide us, to give us wisdom, to direct us, to strengthen us in all of our trials where our human strength would fail. 
but God's strength never does. He gives, us, he gives us sanctification. He helps us to grow and learn through His Word. He illuminates His Word. He allows us to bear maximum fruit for the kingdom of God. So ultimately, when we die, we will receive a reward that is imperishable, unfading, and undefiled, okay? We will also receive, when we die, a perfect, glorified body that never faints, that never grows weary, that never sleeps, that never slumbers, okay? There will be no more tears, no more, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, for the former things have passed away, Revelation 21.4. We receive all of that when we confess Jesus as Lord, okay? It is blessing beyond belief. It is blessing beyond measure. It is blessing that is imperishable, unfading, undefiled, and eternal. So this series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. Once again, a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. You can watch any of these sermons online through the URL. It's getbibletruth.com. I trust this is a great source of edification for believers and evangelism for the unbeliever. I say thank you so much for listening. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.